The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Action's October webinar, What Are Pink Ribbons Hiding? Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Education and Mobilization Coordinator at Breast Cancer Action. Joining me on the webinar today are two presenters who are my colleagues, Annie Sarter, Policy and Campaigns Coordinator, and Angela Wall, Communications Director here at Breast Cancer Action. A few quick announcements before we begin. Breast Cancer Action doesn't take money from any corporation that profits from or contributes to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors. Please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. I want to go over a few webinar etiquette uh, items before we begin the presentation. The presentation of What Are Pink Ribbons Hiding will last about 40 minutes. At any time during the webinar, you can type a question into the question bar, and we'll save time at the end to answer all the questions that we can. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action, and this webinar is a great way to do that. Please stay tuned for other ways that we'll mention later on. So we're going to get started by going through the agenda. We're going to start with Angela, who's going to talk about 30 years of pink and what we have to show, and also about breast cancer's connection to environmental exposures. Annie will come on to talk about strong chemical reform and also the corporate opposition. Angela will then come back to help us understand this critical moment in time and the important assets we have to build a movement for change. Annie will come back to talk about our current Think Before You Pink campaign, Toxic Time is Up, and how you can get involved. And last, as always, we'll wrap up with your questions. Breast Cancer Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women who were frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency, and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crises. Breast Cancer Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the epidemic. Our advocacy is conducted through a social justice lens because the politics and policies of breast cancer disproportionately affect poor women and women of color. Breast Cancer Action's independence from pharmaceutical company funding puts us in a unique position to address issues of health equity and exposures to toxins in our environment and to put the needs of patients before pharmaceutical company profits. We have three main program priorities that we work in. The first is putting patients first, where we advocate at the Food and Drug Administration in favor of treatments that are less toxic, more effective, and less expensive than those already available. We also provide information about breast cancer to anyone who needs it. The second is creating healthy environments, where we work to reduce the involuntary exposures people encounter that put them at risk for breast cancer by holding corporations accountable for unhealthy products and practices. We also support legislation that would better protect us from chemicals in our environment and would make personal care products safer. And last, eliminating social inequities related to breast cancer, where we work to create awareness that it is not just genes, but social injustices, political, economic, and racial inequalities that lead to disparities in breast cancer incidence and outcomes. Our first presenter, Annie, is a core member of the Breast Cancer Action Program team and leads Breast Cancer Action's national campaigns and policy advocacy. Annie's activist background includes environmental and social justice campaigning to slow climate change, demand corporate accountability, and stand up for the rights of people most impacted by greed and inequality. A woman's studies major from the University of Washington, Annie is inspired by Breast Cancer Action's unwavering commitment to women's health. Also joining us on the webinar today is Angela Wall. Angela is Breast Cancer Action's Head of Strategic Communications and Media Relations. Once a university lecturer, online advertising strategic planner, and writer for an underground newspaper, she has also earned a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in Cultural Studies. She has always held an active and passionate interest in women's health and equality. Now I'm going to turn it over to Angela to start our presentation. 
Thanks, Saru, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. So I want to begin by contextualizing this presentation of what what kind of the pink ribbons are hiding by, by talking about the fact that we've pretty much been inundated for the last 30 years with pink ribbon products. And we're looking at a history of um, when the pink ribbon first emerged back in the 90s. Um, but since then, we have just seen an inundation of pink products. And pink products contain many of them. The, the problem comes about when many of them contain hazardous chemicals. And they, they fill the market every October. And they fill the market in the name of breast cancer while simultaneously containing um, ingredients that are uh, linked to an increased risk of breast cancer. So some companies will just sell products to boost their sales and to build their brand, but donate nothing or mere pennies on the dollar to a, a program. Um, others will focus on awareness campaigns, but to be honest, who among us now in 2013 is not aware that breast cancer is a, is a huge problem in this country? And then the worst offenders will sell products in the name of breast cancer that actually contain toxic chemicals that increase a woman's risk of the disease. And many of these include, as you look at your screen now, flame retardants in apparel, phthalates in plastics, BPA in cans, and many other chemicals that, are, that lack safety testing. So how can we tell or track how many of these toxins are in pink products that are out there? We can't. No one can, and that's the problem. Why? Because currently in the US, chemicals are innocent until proven guilty. And when it comes to breast cancer, as well as other diseases and health disorders, that's a huge problem, especially when mounting evidence is starting to suggest that the growing concern for the environmental links to increasing health harms is an issue we should be taking um, seriously. So let's look at the links between breast cancer and the environment. As an organization, Breast Cancer Action has, has partnered with a lot of organizations, and we are, you know, we're working clearly in looking at the science to, to demonstrate the evidence between connections of breast cancer and the environment. So you don't just have to take our word for it that there's a, theory, there's a reason for concern out here. Um, evidence connecting our exposure to environmental toxins and harmful chemicals can be found in everyday products, and this, this evidence is mounting. While there are very few studies that provide conclusive evidence of harm from environmental toxins, this absence of causal proof is not because there's no link. Rather, it's because the gold standard of medical research requires random control studies with two large populations of people, one that's been exposed to chemicals and one that is not. And I'm sure you're already starting to see here that um, the problem is that we all inhabit a, tox a chemical toxic soup as part of our daily existence. So virtually everyone has already been exposed to many of the major chemicals. Since our lifestyles differ so um, vastly, it would be really hard to kind of identify specific populations that haven't been exposed. So already we have a problem when the, um, the gold standard is a causal relationship link, and we can't even um, define the parameters of that kind of experiment, not even to mention that knowingly exposing humans to chemicals suspected of causing harm would be highly unethical. So we kind of end up with a huge dilemma there and a huge challenge. However, um, what we do know is that it's not just how much we're exposed to toxic chemicals, but it's how often and how long. And if we add into this the mix of increasing studies which link chemicals to increased risks of breast cancer in animals, we believe that there is already sufficient evidence for us to be concerned and for us to, to take action to do something to make this different. Because at some point we have to ask ourselves, how much evidence is enough? How long can we wait? And when is it time to act? Chemical uh, or product manufacturers have not been required to examine the safety of their chemicals more closely, and none of these chemicals have been removed from the marketplace because of breast cancer risk or links. And the overwhelming majority of chemicals identified as animal mammary carcinogens have never been included in any any epidemi sorry any epidemi epidemiological study, I don't know why I'm struggling with that word, I say it every day, anyway, of breast cancer. And this needs to change very urgently. We won't end pink washing by shopping for better products or even by targeting individual products one at a time or companies one at a time. We need to go straight to the source and we need to bring about comprehensive, meaningful chemical reform. And I'm going to pass you on to Annie to explain what exactly that looks like. Thank you, and hello, everybody. So what do we mean by strong chemical reform? 
Uh, well, generally, we're talking about the Toxic Substances Control Act, otherwise known as TOSCA for short, which was introduced in 1976 and is the nation's main law aimed at regulating chemicals used in everyday products. This law is extremely outdated, ineffective at regulating environmental contaminants, and woefully inadequate to protect public health from hazardous chemicals in our daily lives. For example, less than 10 of the over 80,000 chemicals in regular use in the United States are heavily regulated or restricted by the EPA under this law. And those 10 do not include chemicals that we keep hearing more and more about, such as phthalates, parabens, BPA, and other chemicals that we know are hazardous and the evidence is mounting. One of the reasons for this is that TOSCA places the burden of proof on consumers and government agencies rather than on the manufacturers of these chemicals to prove that they are harmful, which is incredibly cumbersome. In addition, under current law, chemical manufacturers are allowed to keep ingredients secret and it's difficult for consumers to find information on chemical safety. Anyone who's tried to look up uh, chemicals that are in products that you're using will know that this is true. So all this adds up to many chemicals, such as phthalates and BPA and plastics, parabens and personal care products, flame retardants and apparel and furniture, not being properly regulated, and potentially exposing all of us to a range of health harms, including breast cancer. So what do we want? There are a number of key components to strong chemical regulation and reform, two key aspects, aspects that Breast Cancer Action and many of our friends and allies have identified are burden of proof, which is putting the burden of proof for chemical safety on the shoulders of industry rather than on the EPA having to prove that chemicals are toxic. Secondly, we want to shift to the precautionary principle, which means that any strong chemical safety bill must require that products are proven safe before they enter the marketplace rather than after they are already in our homes and in our, in our bodies. Uh, there are many other aspects of a strong chemical, uh, strong chemical bill, and you can see Breast Cancer Action's ongoing chemical safety work on our website and the URL is on the screen right now. So supporting cancer prevention should be easy, right? Well, it seems like we can all agree that TOSCA is in desperate need of overhaul, and chemical safety regulation is plain common sense. And yet, passing strong TOSCA reform is proving quite difficult and many individuals and organizations have spent years trying to make it happen. So let's see who we're up against. First off is the American Chemistry Council, or the ACC. This is America's oldest trade association of its kind and represents companies engaged in the business of chemistry. The ACC represents hundreds of chemical manufacturers together worth over $770 billion. And this quote that you see on your screen uh, is, is a boast on the ACC's website um, as a reason that companies should be a part of their lobbying group because they will help defeat chemical reform for you. <laughs> I found that very telling. Secondly, Coke Industries and its subsidiaries are actively challenging many of the health and environmental rules that we depend on to protect public health. Their activities include protesting the EPA's effort to update the Toxic Substance Control Act, uh, the chemical substance inventory of it, rather, uh, and Georgia Pacific, one of their subsidiaries, has claimed to the EPA that dioxins aren't really toxic or carcinogenic, uh, which is amazing because of that very short list of 10 chemicals that, Tosca that the EPA has effectively regulated, dioxins are one of that very short list because they are so, so toxic and so universally acknowledged to be so. 
So here we have some pink ribbon products. What could they possibly have in common? Turns out that these same entities that are standing in the way of comprehensive legislation are selling pink ribbon products to consumers. They're making money off of pink ribbon cause marketing, yet actively opposing and blocking chemical reform that could stop cancer before it starts. So let's take a closer look. And first up is the American Chemistry Council. According to Open Secrets, the ACC spent over $9 million in 2012 and so far nearly $5 million in 2013 lobbying elected officials on behalf of the chemical industry. The ACC is made up of over 100 chemical manufacturers and companies that heavily rely on weak chemical regulation. ACC member companies include Exxon, DuPont, Dow Chemical, as well as 3M and Procter & Gamble. You may have heard of 3M. They produce post-it notes and other office supplies. And one of their division also sells a pink stethoscope marketed toward medical workers. The pink stethoscope is currently for sale this year. I think you can buy it <laughs> on their website. And a few dollars for each sale benefits the American Cancer Society. Procter & Gamble is also well known. They have dozens of brands that produce hundreds of products that all of us probably have in our homes or workplaces. Several of Procter & Gamble's brands have pink ribbon promotions in October. And here are a couple examples. Swiffer is selling cleaning supplies, which may include hazardous chemicals in its ingredient list, especially fragrances. Uh, and sale of this product, this pink ribbon cleaning product, benefits the National Breast Cancer Foundation. CoverGirl is our other example. Uh, it's another Procter & Gamble brand that regularly sells pink ribbon products that may include harmful ingredients, uh, which are common and common harmful ingredients in cosmetics tend to be uh, parabens, phthalates, and the such. So next up is Coke Industries. Let's take a closer look at them. Remember that Coke has taken a strong stand against strengthening the EPA's ability to regulate chemicals that are harmful to our health and has actively lobbied against the Safe Chemicals Act of 2011 and 2012. Coke Industries is a huge conglomerate, and one of their subsidiaries is Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific Chemicals produces a wide range of products for use in oil and gas drilling, production, and refining markets. These include chemicals used in additives for drilling, production treating chemicals, and corrosion inhibitors, many of which would and should be closely monitored or restricted under a strong chemical reform bill. Quilted Northern is a subsidiary of Georgia Pacific and promotes Quilted Northern soft and strong champions, which benefit the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Uh, and they do special promotions, I believe, around the walks and runs uh, races for the cure for common. So in summary, the ACC and Coke Industries are taking advantage of breast cancer on a grand scale. They profit from the sale and manufacture of chemicals linked to causing breast cancer, and at the same time, they profit from the sale of pink urban products. What's worse is that they're getting cover from the most prominent cancer charities, in this case, Komen, American Cancer Society, and the National Breast Cancer Foundation in order to get good PR in October and to look like they care about women and breast cancer. And just as an aside, it is not lost on us here at Breast Cancer Action that these big charities are also absent from the effort to pass strong chemical safety reform. I wonder if this could be related. So this is our challenge. Money, power, and influence is standing in our way. But the good news is that there is another side to this story. And I'll turn this back over to Angela to tell us some good news. I like being the good news bearer. Thanks, Annie. So you know, this is one side of the story. I think it's very important when we're addressing a huge issue like pink washing, um, pink cause marketing, and the, the serious money that's to be made in this. 
um, to look at the big picture. And if we look at the big picture, which is the kind of screenshot that you have now, right now currently, corporate interests um, such as those of Coke and the American Chemistry Council feature is just one part of the segment. In addition, there's growing public awareness about the need for um, chemical regulation and growing concern about the connections between environmental toxins and chemicals and our, and, and our declining health and, and increasing health harms. And there's also you know, developing policy momentum, um, developing recognition um, amongst legislators and agencies of record recognizing that this is a problem. And there's also the activists and coalitions who have seriously been building a movement to really change this. So let's look a little more detail at these things. And let's go to growing attention first. So links between environmental exposures and breast cancer are in the news more and more as the evidence builds. Um, pick up any national or local paper any day of the week, and it's likely that the paper or outlet is covering some kind of story reflecting the growing concern over toxic, toxic links to diseases and disorders. Check out local film and national film festivals. Um, people are talking about this and on a massive scale looking to seriously get the word out and are, build, are building a movement to raise our consciousness and educate everybody about the links and the studies that are in, increasingly making their way to, to the light of day, letting us know about the connections between environmental health harms and um, diseases and disorders. But it's not just on a media level. This is also happening at a federal level. Um, the issue of environmental health damage is on the radar of the federal government. The 2008-2009 President's Cancer Panel quite clearly states that, quote, the true burden of environmentally induced cancers has been grossly underestimated, end quote. And the panel advised that the President, quote, use the power of your office to remove the carcinogens and other toxins from our food, water, and air that needlessly increase health care costs cripple our nation's productivity, and devastate American lives. Furthermore, in 2011, the Institute of Medicine, Breast Cancer, and the Environment, a life course approach study, or report rather, clearly states that a cascade of scientific evidence shows that environmental chemicals have biological activity that plausibly links them to breast cancer risk. In 2013, the Interagency Breast Cancer and Environmental Research Coordinating Committee highlighted the need for increased funding and research of the various chemical and physical factors that may contribute to breast cancer, as well as the potential for cancer prevention, not just diagnosis and treatment, to decrease both the incidence of cancer and healthcare costs. This is the third federal cancer panel report to highlight the unrealized potential for cancer prevention and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine released a joint statement recently urging OBGYNs to advocate for government policy changes to identify and reduce exposure to toxic environmental agents, saying that, quote, lawmakers should require the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and industry to define and estimate the dangers that aggregate exposure to harmful chemicals that harmful chemicals pose to pregnant women, infants, and children and act to protect these vulnerable populations. So we see that there is growing evidence and growing recognition of this evidence, which leads us to activists for healthcare and environmental change. And this is where it becomes up to us. There's been a number of organizations that for years have been involved in uh, demanding change around environmental um, chemical reform and, and make, and and, and kind of pushing the links and pushing us to make the connection between environmental hazards and unhealth harms. Safe Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition represents over 11 million individuals across the United States. They, uh, coalition partners have testified at the March and July 2013 hearings in the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. They've organized hundreds of meetings with policymakers and events across the country. They've produced reports and fact sheets to document scientific findings and economic analysis to support TOSCA reform. And this is all since they were formed four and a half years ago. So I just want to kind of point out that 11 million people 
have joined this coalition and have been reached by this coalition in four and a half years, and that's incredible. That's the level of interest and concern about this issue that's out there. So if you're on this webinar because you're concerned, you, we are not alone. Um, in addition, the Silent Spring Institute, which is a research organization studying the environment and breast cancer, recently launched its Too Close to Home website that offers a comprehensive research list on where hazardous chemicals can be found in our daily lives and provides research for advocates. Furthermore, um, what's really interesting is in 2007, scientists from the Silent Spring Institute um, published in the journal Cancer the results of a literature research uh, literature search identifying 216 chemicals associated with increases in mammary gland tumors in at least one well-conducted animal study. And of these, 73 have been present in consumer products or as contaminants in food, 35 are air pollutants, 29 are produced at more than 1 million pounds per year in the United States, and 25 have involved occupational exposures to more than 5,000 women. Yet despite the near certainty of this widespread exposure and demonstration of this widespread exposure to many of these chemicals, the findings have triggered virtually no regulatory or other policy concerns, or response rather, sorry, and that's devastating. And then, of course, a, a kind of a player whose you know breast cancer action has been has been very active in demanding um, chemical and, and environmental links to breast cancer and, and chemical reform. And this year, that's why it's the focus of our um, campaign. So, if we turn and look at, I'm oh, sorry, and let me just draw your attention to some of our partners who. Um, have also been very active over many years. Um, Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, the Breast Cancer Fund, um, Sandra Steingraber has written an, um, some devastatingly powerful um, pieces around this issue and continues to tour the country, um, you know, really mobilizing and galvanizing people to join, to join in with anti-fracking and, and other issues. Um, so let's move to policy momentum. Well, it looks like as of today, um, we, we have a, a government again that's open and ready to do business, hopefully not business as usual. And we're here as part of this, uh, uh, as a movement to try and demand that they do business differently. So what we have right now is for the first time in many years, comprehensive chemical reform actually appears likely. Because Democratic and Republican parties are in this very unusual moment actually willing to work together in this recognition that Tosca is outdated and needs to be reformed. This summer, the Senate Committee on the Environment and Public Works, the committee that's responsible for moving forward the Tosca Reform Bill, held a hearing to debate the future of toxic chemical reform in the United States. And the most significant outcome from this hearing was general agreement that the country's chemical laws are out of date and inadequate, and that reforming it is a priority. We're thrilled, and we're, we welcome this political momentum for chemical reform. And we're working hard to take advantage of this interest and momentum to make real change. We cannot have business as usual. Women continue to die. We need to do something differently. But we don't want a weak reform bill that lets politicians pat themselves on the back that fails to really protect our health. So we need to act together to ensure that only the strongest chemical bill possible moves forward. Members of both the Democratic and the Republican parties seem willing to work together on a solution to reform Tosca. Senators from both sides of the aisle underscored the need for this reform and their willingness to work together, which is refresh refreshing and definitely a demonstration of something other than the status quo and business as usual in Washington. So one thing that we need to really do now is make sure that we push this over the top to get the reform that we need. And we're very, very close. However, we've still got a lot of work to do. And this is a, while this is a key moment, we need to really galvanize and bring this movement to its pinnacle so we can push this over the top. We have to keep up the momentum and demand strong, meaningful reform that will protect our health. And this October, we have a real opportunity to make a difference because the 
spotlight is being is highlighting women's health. We, we're fortunate in that respect that this is this timing is, is is really working in our favor. That it's October, the spotlight is on women's health, and we have this opportunity um, within the Senate to have a focus on chemical policy reform and some serious work to bring about cancer prevention. We could make history with this movement to stop cancer before it starts. We could eliminate toxic chemicals from our lives and end pinkwashing once and for all. And to talk to you about Breast Cancer Action's specific um, program this year to do that, I'm going to pass you back to Annie. Toxic time is up. So uh, I think we've tried to make a good case as to why this October Breast Cancer Action is working to build a movement of people to demand common sense chemical safety reform and end pink washing once and for all. This campaign is really resonating with activists around the court around the country and we already have, as of this morning, almost thirteen thousand signatures on our Toxic Time is Up petition and we are thrilled and I hope that um, it continues to gain momentum to and toxic pink washing once and for all. So I hope that everybody here on the line gets involved. And there are many ways that you can get involved and support the campaign. The first is that you can sign the petition. If you go to our website, www.bcaction.org, uh, there's a link right on the front page where you can sign the petition. Secondly, share the petition. Send the link to your friends. Use your social media presence to promote the petition and get your friends and family to sign it and share it themselves. Next, you can host a Pink Ribbons, Inc. screening. Pink Ribbons, Inc. is a very powerful film that came out a couple years ago. And it does a fantastic profile of the many problems with the Pink Ribbon, many of which we've discussed here today. So if you would like. To get your own copy of this film, you can contact us and host the screening in your home, in your office, in your school, wherever it makes sense to you. And finally, you can become what we're calling a super activist. <laughs> this means that you can commit to generating petition signatures uh, on the Toxic Time is Up petition for us. So we would work with you to take the petition, again, to school, to work, to wherever you think that there are people who care about this issue might be, uh, and generate as many as you can. We're hoping somewhere between 50 and 100 for, our super, for each of our super activists. And you can find us uh, to do all of these things, and we'll have more information about how to reach us at the end of this webinar. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Saru. Thank you so much, Annie and Angela, for your wonderful presentations. And um, we're going to be opening up to your questions in just one minute. And I want to remind you to continue to type your questions into the question bar. And people have been doing that already and continue to do that. And we'll take them in a minute. But before we do, I just want to talk a little bit more about how you can get involved. Because we all know that breast cancer doesn't just happen in October. So if you want to keep up to date all year long and participate in this conversation, you can um, Become a member. Sign up for news and action alerts from Breast Cancer Action and keep up to date on the issues. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter and connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can help others get involved. You can tell your friends, coworkers, and family members about this webinar and how they can take action and get involved. And last, you can donate to support our education and advocacy work. So I want to review a couple of uh, emails and websites that, that we have alluded to. The first is um, if you want to contact Annie to become a super activist or uh, just to find out any more about our Think Before You Pink campaign this year, Toxic Time is Up, you can contact her at her email there. If you're interested in finding out more about the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition, you can check out their website also on the screen. For more information about Think Before You Pink and our 12 years of history and campaigns, and also about our current 2013 campaign, you can go to the Think Before You Pink website, which is a part of Breast Cancer Action. 
And last, you can download our Think Before You Pink toolkit with the 2013 supplement that explains the toxic time is up. And uh, the website is up on the screen. Um, and in case you haven't been able to jot all these down very quickly, we will be sending a follow-up email with the same information. So again, uh, I want to remind you that Breast Cancer Action really relies on your support to make these webinars possible, and your individual support of our work is so very crucial. If you've been in inspired today, please consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue making these free webinars possible. You can go to bcaction.org backslash donate and make a donation. I want to give a really big thank you to Annie and Angela for their wonderful presentations today. And now I'd like to open it up for your questions. And as I've said before, people have been typing in their questions as we've been giving the presentation. So we're going to go through and answer them. And hopefully we'll be able to get to all that we can. I want to start, there have been a number of questions, people asking uh, about getting a copy of this webinar. and. Um, we record all of our webinars, including this one, and we make them available on our website. Uh, they're usually up on our website about a week after, um, so you can check back on our website next week and it should be posted. So you can watch it again, you can pass it on to friends um, or family. Uh, there's a question, someone says, I am all for chemical reform and believe toxic chemicals in the environment and in pr products should be regulated, but show me numbers that support your argument. What percentage of breast cancer is due to environmental toxins? What percentage from genetics? How about smoking? When do we make individuals responsible for their health? How about the adults who smoke in their cars with their infant children in the back seat? I'm going to pass this to Angela to uh, take a stab at answering this wonderful question. That's a great question. Thanks. Um, what we know is that um, in terms of genetics, less than, um, I mean, and the numbers are hard, less than 30% of breast cancers are genetic and hereditary, which leaves 70% um, with unknown risks. And the issue around showing the numbers is, I don't know if you were on the webinar earlier, but the, the, the issue of showing causal relationships between environmental links to breast cancer and breast cancer specifically is, is near impossible to do. And so what we have to do is start to look at the emerging materials and the emerging studies that demonstrate connections. We see pockets of you know, communities in various places where um, there are um, you know, toxic dumps or particular toxic clouds, um, and we see increased um, rates of breast cancer in those areas. Um, there comes a point where we believe that we need to stop using women as the canaries in the coal mine. That currently, until we say the proof, it, we either take the attitude of we need the numbers to demonstrate the proof, otherwise we can't really fully get behind this legislation, or we say 70% of breast cancers we cannot identify the causes for. And what we do know is that there are emerging connections between toxic chemicals and health harms. And we are going to, we're going to take you know, what we know in that area and say we have enough evidence from these studies to demonstrate that right now this is something we're willing to pursue. And that's, that's basically where we are. There's, there's, there's too many women getting sick and we can't identify the causes. So we have to start looking at things in, in, in ways that, that work towards prevention rather than kind of Keeping, keeping testing and keeping guinea pig, um, keeping women as guinea pigs, you know, and, until we have um, some kind of 100% evidence. Because how many women will be dead by then? Thank you, Angela. Another question comes in. Um, someone writes: Hard to imagine, given recent federal shutdown, that Congress members will be willing to work together to strengthen Tosca. Can you talk a little bit about why there is any hope of agreement at this time? You know, I have the same question. <laughs> this is Annie. Uh, yes, I think that is a good question. And I think that our you know, hope for collaboration in Congress is probably at an all-time low, especially given events of the past two weeks. But here's, here's why we have hope. 
So uh, as, as we discussed, the efforts towards safe chemical regulation in Tosca and Tosca updates have sort of have made headway most every year for the past several years. This year, what happened was two bills were introduced. Earlier, first was the Safe Chemicals Act, which generally environmentalists and uh, health advocates, including Breast Cancer Action, supported wholeheartedly. Uh, and the second was the Chemical Safety Improvement Act. Uh, it was introduced a couple months later in response. Chemical Safety Improvement Act is quite a weak bill, where the Safe Chemicals Act was a quite strong bill. But what ended up happening was uh, Barbara Boxer, who is the chairman of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, where both bills were introduced, called a hearing at the very end of July 2013, where there was general discussion amongst the senators, as well as other stakeholders, about what to do about Tosca reform. And there was plenty of debate about the merits of the Chemical Safety Improvement Act versus Safe Chemicals Act. But what's important is that everybody in the room agreed that Tosca reform needed to happen across, across the aisles. And so what that means is that now is the time for us to mobilize, because it's going to happen. Everybody agrees that it needs to happen. And what we need to do is make sure that what happens, the reform that happens, is as strong as it possibly can be. Because we don't want to see a Tosca reform bill that is quite weak go through. If this is our big opportunity, we want something that really will protect people and all of our public health, um, because this is our big moment. So I think that it's reasonable to feel underwhelmed by Congress, but I also think that this is, we're in a key moment of time, and we'd really like to see momentum move forward this fall, and we'd really like to see something come together next year. Thank you, Annie. Um, there's another question. Um, someone asks, any ideas about how to talk to my kids about the giant pink shoes? And I think this uh, this is a great question, and it goes beyond just those. But uh, I'm going to pass this on to Angela to talk about this a little bit more. Thanks. One of those moments where I'm glad my child doesn't watch uh, baseball. Um, it's a great question. I mean, how do you talk to? It's not just your kids. How do you talk to your your friends, your family who are support? You know, who are supporting um, walks and runs um, or some of the issues that you may have uh, concerns about. You know, my um, my experience with this, with my own child even, has been to just go through a question and answer conversation. What, what, why do you think they're wearing pink? I mean, I think it's all about what do we need to do? What do we need to change? What do we want the end result to be? And if pink shoes, wearing pink shoes, makes people aware of breast cancer, then the issue of what does that do to change the reality for both women living with and who are diagnosed now and women in the future. It, it does Raising awareness does very little. There are more concrete things that we need to be doing. And I would just start to go through the list of the alternative things that we could be doing um, other than sporting um, pink shoes. And I think the issue goes into who benefits most from wearing pink shoes. Who gets, to, who gets to feel really good about it? Do women with breast cancer get to feel really good about it? Do the um, sponsors or the providers of the pink shoes get to feel really good about it? Probably because they get to have really good brand awareness um, that they're an organization whose brand is sympathetic and supportive of women's issues. That's all great, but do the women who are actually supposed to be the beneficiaries of this actually benefit in any concrete way? I mean, so I think it's a great conversation uh, uh, to be having with everybody, I mean, both kids, family members, friends. Um, and it's about kind of you know challenging the dominant conversations that are currently in circulation about how we address public health crises, which breast cancer action, of course, is. Thank you, Angela. I also just want to um, say that if um, people haven't seen the Think Before You Pink toolkit, um, it's uh, a really great tool. Um, and some of the uh, information in there is about how do you talk to 
anyone really about walks and runs and pink ribbon products. And I think there's some good ideas in there for talking to anyone, including including kids. There's another question. Um, someone writes, why hasn't the American Cancer Society or the Komen organization, why aren't they on board with our organization? And wouldn't these organizations be beneficial um, in this cause? Or are they part of the cover-up? And I'm going to pass this on to Annie to uh, answer. Uh, I think that I share that question. <laughs> you know, I think that American Cancer Society, Komen, Avon, many of these organizations, um, you know, they certainly serve a role in society. They certainly support and provide valuable resources and support for many people. A lot of people get a lot of value out of working with these organizations. Uh, but I do think that especially given the status of task reform this fall, uh, I think that these organizations that we've just named, their absence, in the conversation around task reform is significant. And I think that if they were to come on and join us, um, and many of the other advocates working for chemical safety reform, they could be a really tremendous benefit to, um, to this push that we're making. And I hope to see them join us soon. Thank you, Annie. Um, we have another question. Um, someone asks, I see the pink ribbon associated with more than Susan G. Komen. Groups like the Stephanie Spielman Fund, which I actually have not heard of, uh, Avon Foundation and American Cancer Society. Are these groups affiliated with Susan G. Komen? Is it safe to assume they all follow the same agenda, early detection instead of prevention, and ignoring the link between breast cancer and chemicals? And for that, I'm going to pass it to Angela. So there's a couple of uh, parts to this question I see. And I think, um, yeah, the pink ribbon is associated with more groups than just Komen and et cetera, the ones named. And, and I want to just touch on why that is. Um, because uh, I, I'm sure many people by now know, but the pink ribbon is not trademarked. It is not um, contained or restricted in its use. So anybody can place a pink ribbon on any product whatsoever. and claim to be supporting uh, women with breast cancer or doing something around breast cancer, whether it's awareness, research, or whatever. And um, you know, this has been part of the problem, that it's unregulated. So there's no way both to regulate who uses it, and then there's no way to regulate how much of the funds goes where and to what, and how much accountability and transparency is around that fundraising. And hence, we get to the very reason you know, over 12 years ago, why um, Breast Cancer Action started to look into this and created the Think Before You Pink campaign in the first place. The second part of this question is, is it safe to assume that these, uh, these, com these other organizations are following a similar agenda to Komen? You know, I think there is a, there's a mainstream breast cancer movement agenda. Um, and we can call it agenda, or we can say platform, or however we want to define it. Um, that is very different from breast cancer actions. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get into, you know, making claims about what these other organizations do or do not do. Um, you know, I think that there's a definite theme of early detection. And I think that one of the ways you can determine whether or not the organization you want to follow or support is doing the kind of work you want to see done, is to look at the kind of work that they are doing. And you know, I, I do know that you know that it, it's people can do work that they say is around prevention. They can do research and studies into you know breast cancer the, and the environment. And as happened recently with a huge study um, that was actually funded by Komen, was the environment was actually considered you know the human body, the environment of the human body. So the study looked into how you could actually, what you could do in terms of food you ate, exercise you took to maintain your own kind of healthy, um, healthy lifestyle. And one of the issues that Breast Cancer Action has with that is that, you know, the burden of responsibility is not, some, some responsibility is on individuals to take care of themselves. Unfortunately, the shortcomings with that are that not everybody is equally 
does, has equal access to the same capabilities to take care of themselves. And we get into a huge problem of have and have nots when we start to place the burden of responsibility on individuals to take care of them, themselves and to stop themselves from getting breast cancer. And so the, the issue of prevention uh, and, and going for chemical reform and, um, and, and legislation that actually stops these um, chemicals from getting into the marketplaces and getting into our daily lives and bodies in the first place shifts that burden of responsibility back onto the government to regulate manufacturers, which is arguably the job of the government, right, which is to take care of, of the members of the community that inhabit the um, jurisdiction areas of that government. And so, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's more than simply looking out for ourselves and making sure that I'm safe and my family is safe. Because what about all those people that don't have access to the tools they need uh, for whatever reasons, economic, geographic, political, social, cultural, communal, that, that don't enable the same capacity to, um, to self-care. And that's just not an acceptable um, society. It's, it's an unjust world as far as we're concerned. Thank you, Angela. Um, Someone had a question. We had mentioned um, having your own screening of uh, pink ribbon zinc, and someone mentioned that um, they tried uh, to to do it, and um, that there were some costs associated due to copywriting laws. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, Breast Cancer Action um, has been and was working with um, the dis distribution company here in the U.S., and um, we are offering the DVD for, uh, as a gift with a donation, and we're happy to work with people to make it work because really for us, um, we would like community screenings to be happening in people's living rooms, in libraries, in universities, anywhere that, that people can get together and, and watch this film. So if you are interested both to that um, listener and to anyone else, you can contact, um, contact me or just contact info at bcaction.org. Um, there's another question uh, someone asks, how do pink ribbon products get to contain toxic and harmful uh, chemicals in the first place? And for that, I'm going to pass it to Annie. So I would say that's, that's exactly the problem. So pink ribbon products are not, there's, you know, they're not licensed. There's no rule that they have to follow in order to get to use the pink ribbon. And because we don't have sufficient chemical safety laws, we have quite a lot of products on the market that include hazardous chemicals linked to health harms, including breast cancer. So putting two and two together, <laughs> some of these products are going to end up with pink ribbons on them. And they do. And they just astoundingly, many of them do. And we see every year new products, whether it's a, a pink candle for breast cancer awareness that has fragrances that um, you know have phthalates in them, or shampoos, or you know Swiffer cleaning products, or apparel that might have flame retardants. Um, it's I've, I'm just amazed by the number of products that have chemicals of concern included in their ingredient list, and I'm amazed by that just lack of ability to connect two and two together and to sell products linked to breast cancer for breast cancer awareness. And that's the whole point of our Think For You paint campaign, is to help consumers ask the critical questions that they need to ask when they're buying, if they're considering buying pink ribbon products, to make sure that the products themselves are safe and make sure that money is actually going somewhere to actually benefit uh, women living with and at risk of breast cancer. So I think Saru mentioned that we have a Think Before You Pink toolkit that can be downloaded from our thinkbeforeyoupink.org website. Uh, many of these issues that we're bringing up here today and addressing this question can be answered in that toolkit. And I really en encourage people to, down to download it and take a look. Thank you, Annie. We're, we're getting to the end of our webinar, and I want to uh, take one last question, and then we're going to close. Uh, the last question is, I'm curious why the US does not adopt a precautionary approach to chemical reform, while many, many other countries do? And for that, I'm going to pass it to Angela to answer. 
thanks. Um, it is a, a sad. I mean, in Europe, um, Europe currently adopts a kind of precautionary approach to health um, for a lot of the reasons that we kind of, you know, the, the benefit and the reasons that, that kind of many people who support that position in this country have identified that it, you know, it, a preventative and a precautionary approach to health is actually a lot more affordable. It keeps costs down and it also keeps us for a healthier community and a, a healthier nation. Um, I also think that a lot of the reasons that we addressed in this webinar actually account for um, you know, why we do not have a precautionary approach. Um, I'll go as far as to say there's, there's perhaps less money in it. Uh, you know, I think we all know that money talks and as we pointed out in this webinar, you know, there's a, a lot of money that is um, buying a, a, a lot of uh, seats at tables to have discussions around, um, you know, uh, how how these conversations go. And I think what what the you know, and I think it's it's also there's a, there's a bigger issue, it's a bigger a cultural difference, a historic difference. But I think one of the big interesting points about you know U.S. history is this is a you know this is this is a country and a culture that's built on um, people having their say and people righting wrongs and people creating justice um, out of injustices. And I think that the opportunity here is to let you know, our government know, let our legislators know that we do not support this approach to chemical um, regulation, that we demand better. And the history within the US is, is that when movements rise up to demand change, change happens. And that's actually one of the things that I feel most confident about um, with this campaign and with the potential future of, of, of Tosca, is that, you know, it's going to depend on people like us you who are listening to this webinar, people like us working for an organization like Breast Cancer Action, the reach, the connection we make together, going out into our individual communities, talking to people one conversation at a time. Some, you talk to someone who talks to someone who talks to someone. And eventually we, what we see is you know, Safer Chemicals Healthy Families has 11 million people that they have you know, been speaking to, 11 million people changing the conversation. We have reached 12,000 people with this petition. That's 12,000 more people who are changing the conversation. This is about building a movement, and it's not going to happen unless we build it together. Thank you again, everyone who has been on this call, and to Angela and Annie for their presentations, and for all your wonderful questions and comments. If we didn't answer your question today, you can always follow up with us at info at bcaction.org. Um, thank you so much for attending, and, and please watch your email for a short survey where you can provide feedback on this webinar. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon and evening.